that's been the difference here in terms of this project. All of the agree- ingredients came together in a way that cooked a dish we can say now is Oscar nominated. I don't take any of it for granted. And, uh, you know, you're only as good as your next one, Willie. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome to the Walker Webcast and my discussion with my old and great friend, Jeffrey Wright. Uh, let me dive in, Jeff, for a quick intro, and then we'll dive into the conversation. Not so old. Not so old. Not so old, exactly. You got it. Let's see. Just by calendar date years, not not uh, the two of us being so old. So actually, speaking of that, I didn't know that you were born on Pearl Harbor Day in 1965, which is actually my brother's birthday. I didn't know whether you knew oh. that, but my brother Taylor was born on the same day as you. The same day. Uh, wow. Same day. Exact same day. Uh, Jeffrey has received numerous accolades, including a Primetime Emmy Award, a Tony Award, a Golden Globe Award, in addition to his recent nomination for the Academy Award as Best Actor. Wright began his career in theater, where he gained prominence for his role in the Broadway production of Angels in America, for which he won a Tony Award for Best Featured Actor in a Play. His first starring film role was uh, as Jean-Michel Bastiat in Bastiat. His other notable films include Shaft, Syriana, Lady in the Water, Cadillac Records, The Ideas of March, and Rustin. He also acted uh, in the Wes Anderson films The French Dispatch and Asteroid City, and has played Felix Leiter in the James Bond films Casino Royale, Quantum of Solace, and No Time to Die. Petit Latier. By the way, I thought I had never seen that, Jeff, but Light, Felix Leiter in James Bond and Petit Latier in uh, Hunger Games. There's, I don't know the writers. Vitti. Vitti. I, but the, the writers, the, the, those last names of uh, uh, Leiter and Latier, I thought were a little bit too close to each other. Um, and well, Jim Gordon in- They would say Latier. Uh, I think that was actually an add-on for the movie. I don't think his last name is referenced in the books, but I mean- Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, he not, he received a nomination for the Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in American Fiction, which we will talk about today. Um, done a bunch on uh, television, which I want to dive into a little bit, Jeff, in uh, Boardwalk Empire, Westworld. Um, his voice has also been used as Isaac Dixon in the video game The Last of Us Part Two, uh, as well as also The Watcher in the Marvel Studios animated series, What If? Jeff has two college-aged children, lives in New York, hails from Washington, D.C., is a diehard Skins fan like me, went to St. Albans School, which is where we met and played lacrosse together, was an All-American lacrosse player at Amherst College, did his graduate. Easy, 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 all NESCAC. All NESCAC. See, Hereford said you were All-American, all NESCAC. I thought you got All-American when you jumped out of the goal and went and played attack your freshman year. I was all NESCAC, uh, I think, freshman and sophomore year. And then I started acting. <laughs> and uh, two of my buddies were all American senior year. And I was, uh, yeah, what happened to you, dude? Yeah, I was <laughs> leading score and, you know, all that stuff. And then I started acting and it all went to hell, Willie. It all went to hell. So I was on a call earlier today with our mutual friend, Johnny Rice. And he said your acting career really started impersonating Coach Allenson, McNair, and Bob Brown at St. Albans. So I thought maybe to start this off, I'd ask you to do a Bob Brown impersonation. Oh, Bob Brown. I don't know if I do a great Bob Brown, but Johnny's partly correct there. Yeah, there was a lot of work put in, a lot of study put in, character study with those guys uh i do a good mr dubsky you remember mr dubsky who's a physics teacher oh yeah brown, i mean brown you have to have like the you know you've got to have a dental piece in there you know you gotta how, how about how about how about coach mcnair he was he was uh he was quite the i remember coach mcnair running me around the football pitch Whew. yeah you know, yeah man, did he drive me hard although bob brown does have one of the most uh, stinging and lasting quotes, I think, of any of the coaches we played with. And it involved one of our friends uh, whom he uh, 
he referred to, he said, man, you're just a pair of shoes out there. You're just a pair of shoes out there. I won't, I'm going to protect the uh, less than innocent by not naming his name, but he's, he's shoes to this day. But I, I've lost my touch with, uh, with those impressions, uh, I think. I think, uh, Willie. Yeah. So um, you lost your dad early, uh, Jeff, and you were raised by your mom and by your aunt. That's great. Um, and when I was going back and forth with McGuire getting ready for this, he said, oh, you got to bring Barbara into the conversation. And, yeah. and you know, part of the storyline, Jeff, in American fiction is that your character, Monk, is thrust into a caretaking role for his mother when she's diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And um, there's some scary moments in that movie when you're out on the beach trying to find your mom. There's some uh, uh, sad moments, that moment when you're... Um, your mom in the movie uh, makes that comment to your brother um, about uh, knowing that he wasn't gay, which was obviously super, super painful at that moment. Uh, and then some really fun moments like when the mother in the film is dancing with your brother's half-naked gay boyfriend at the, yeah. at the wedding reception. Yeah. I'm just curious, as you were filming it, Jeff, any memories of your mom that came up saying, I've been here? Well, I, uh, that section of the film, I think, is a really welcoming one for a lot of people. Uh, you, you, we, some of us reach that point in our lives where we are disabused of, you know, the youthful idea that life gets easier as you get older. And uh, it, it can happen. It can happen overnight. My mom passed away uh, about a year or so before I got this script uh, of colon cancer, it was actually uh, kind of shockingly fast. Um, and as you said, I was raised by uh, by my mom and and my aunt, her eldest sister, who came to live with uh, us in Brooklyn immediately. Uh, you know, as my mother was ailing. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm an only child, so I was looking after my mom and doing the best I could with her uh, in uh, her, you know, her final phase. And uh, and meanwhile, um, looking after my aunt and my kids. And this was November of 2019, just a few months before the pandemic set in. So it was, yeah, it all came came at me in a rush. So when I read this script, um, I was really taken by that aspect of the film. The film is a social satire. It's dealing with uh, you know a lot of tricky issues around race and identity and inclusion, conversations that are being had across the country right now. And it's it's really well drawn and it's satirical. So it's funny. You know, we throw darts around the room, including at ourselves. You know, we try not to take ourselves. I don't think too seriously as well. And therefore, there's a there's a framework within the film for uh, some healthy listening, I think, and for uh, maybe a little bit of an elevation of the dialogue around these things uh, while we have a laugh, you know, at least within the two hours that the film runs. But for me, it was that family portrait that exists on the other side of the film. The guy has written a novel under an assumed name, uh, my character, uh, that, you know, is kind of a send up of urban fiction. Turns out it's his best selling novel, but he writes it under an assumed name and has to, uh, play this dual identity as this character, Stag R. Lee, this caricature that he creates based on the, you know, the reference to the 19th century pimp caricature. And anyway, he's leading this absurd, you know, <laughs> dual life where he's misperceived by the outside world and he's playing this, you know, uh, putting on this mask. Meanwhile, his his real life is, is pretty ordinary, ordinary in that it's something we all recognize. He's just having to be the adult inside the room of his family, managing a series of crises. And he's primarily playing caretaker to his mother. So there's something I think so wonderfully subversive about that aspect of it. Cause it's like, Hey, this is the reality. This is my life. This is who I am. It's a very simple thing. It's a very recognizable thing. Uh, it's in its humanness. And it was that side of the story that really kind of, I related to on an intimate level because I, I was there. Um, and 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 I knew it. I knew the pressures that it exerts on a 
on a on a life, you know, uh, creatively, professionally, personally. So yeah, I don't know if the or I, I know that the exact circumstances for me were not the same, but um, but I understood. I understood what that space looks like. You know, I spent a spent a lot of months cursing out insurance company representatives and various clinicians and you know answerers of the phone and on on various hospital wards and so it's um yeah it's been really gratifying to hear from a lot of people who have seen the film that they felt seen uh by that aspect of the film and validated some say you know it was tough but at the same time it really moved me in a way that uh, was surprising so um yeah for me that's that's really the soul of the movie that's that's where it is and that's yeah when my son saw the film he said you know i see a lot of myself in in that character uh i see a lot of myself in terms of trying to be my authentic self but being underappreciated or misperceived by the world outside. And he said, you know, and it's also a beautiful homage to grandma. Mm. And I said, yeah, you got it, man. Start a legacy. Start turning dreams into realities. A better world begins with you. Better communities start with us. Your mom um, took you to the theater as a kid, and I've heard you, Jeff, talk about the fact that when you went to the Ford's Theater, to the Kennedy Center, and watched the show, that you you actually would think that the show went on behind the behind the curtain after it ended, which I thought was so wonderful. Thinking about you being eight years old, saying they're continuing to act behind stage, and this story continues on. And as I thought about that, I thought about you know when the Hunger Games came to an end, we were all really happy that the Hunger Games came to an end. Um, but in a movie like American Fiction. Isn't the idea that the story goes on? And and if the story does go on there, how would you hope that the story of American fiction goes on? Well, I mean, I think that is actually uh, the idea with any of these uh, pieces, whether they be plays or f- or films, that a world is created. A reality is created. That's the beauty of what we get to do when we when we do this work and when we work with people who are aspirational and who are smart, gifted writers, we in some ways inhabit a kind of idealized reality. Uh, there may be difficulties inside of it, but the, the, the perspective on these things we hope is somewhat heightened, is maybe maybe if you if you found the right writer actually approaches kind of an enlightened perspective it's 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 elevated and we create these worlds and the idea is for the audience to suspend disbelief and 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 think that you know that for a moment anyway that that is a reality and so yeah it, i guess it implies that that world does go on at least inside the mind and so yeah i i was tuned into that <laughs> I think in a in a pretty uh, big way very early on. I was I remember that absolutely vividly. I just like maybe it was maybe I was just hopeful, uh, but yeah, it was just seemed to me that 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 world was back there, you know, in the depths of this of uh, of the of the the space behind the curtain, and I, it just yeah, it was magic. Those were magical nights for me. They really were, really were super memorable. I mean. Uh, and we saw a range of things, you know, uh, just everything that came through from New York. Didn't see a lot of the local theater uh, stuff, but every touring show that came from New York, practically, my mom took me to to see. Yeah, and at, you know, the Fords, you know, and so much history there, of course, and Kennedy Center, and, uh, but mainly the Fords and uh, the National and the Warner. Yeah, those were my, those were. And you didn't, you didn't do any acting at St. Albans. It was, it was, it was Michael Bennett who was like the lead role. And most of I, I, I think it's hysterical that Michael yeah. <laughs> is now in politics and you're the famous actor and it's like, what's, what's real, what's Memorex and, and, and yeah. you know, who's actually got the acting role and who's actually got the real role. But yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty, 
a pretty blurred line between politics and uh, and showbiz. You know, it's uh, but Michael was a wonderful actor. Yeah, I mean, he did all he did everything. He did it was I think Mother Courage they did. I remember maybe a couple Eugene O'Neill plays. You know, I remember one time we were sitting in the front row because we were idiots and we were you know giving him. You know, I think we might have been even throwing things, throwing you know, just trying to distract him, being complete. You know. And immature knuckleheads but uh but he was a wonderful wonderful actor and uh but i think he's a better he's a better senator he's one of the you know he's 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 uh i like his pragmatism you know mm-hmm. and i like his uh level-headedness and uh he's a serious thinker you know and uh and he's a grinder he always was always uh you know pretty dogged in his efforts and uh we're super lucky to have him here in colorado i'll tell you that yeah and 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 lucky i I am amazed that he has maintained you know a level of grace and 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 sanity really in the midst of all that's gone on in uh in uh, in the u.s capitol in these last few years that he's been there but uh but yeah he's he's uh he's a he's, he's a tough guy too we play football together as well I know. I, look, I, I remember when you guys were in A form and I was in C form and yeah. looking up to you and McGuire and Bennett is like the stars of the A form football team. And uh, I remember it's, I, uh, back then I played like middle linebacker and uh, and quarterback. You know, that was before everyone else grew and, and I didn't. And Michael, I remember played cornerback. And Michael was, you know, he was, you know, he wasn't the biggest guy. He's, you know, he, he spurted like, uh, late in high school or maybe even after but little guy on the corner you're there and i would see him man and he would he would dive in there and he would get you know he'd t- take it pretty hard you know and he'd get back up and you know come back to the huddle and go out and do it again i i, I always remember that i always remember him being a tough one out there and, and yeah he's, he still is yeah well one of the things that i couldn't quite foot jeff was that when asked about why you hadn't started acting earlier, one of the responses you gave was that, you know, the thought of getting up on stage in front of all those people, just, you know, man, that was a lot of pressure and a lot of, you know, a lot of eyes on. And then I think about you as a lacrosse goalie and yeah. there's, there is no other position in team sports that puts more eyes on and more pressure on someone than they're playing lacrosse goalie. So I'm like, hang on a second. He decided to do this, but he decided not to do that until later on. I mean, it, it seemed a little inconsistent. Yeah, you might be right. I was just anxious about being on stage for whatever reason. And I would, I, even then, even before I was acting, I think I, I remember having dreams about it and, and, and having experiences where the words wouldn't come. And it was just like the classic actor nightmares, even though I had never really done it except at the, you know, Christmas, uh, you know, school, uh, play in kindergarten or something like that. But yeah, I mean, goalie, goalie was thrust upon me though, you know, which is the reason I played both goalie and extra man midfield. Because I started off in sixth grade in A form playing attack or playing midfield, then seventh and eighth grade played attack. But I used to like to screw around in the goal before practice. Right. In eighth grade, Steve Pryor, our goalie, was sick for a game. And our coach was Jake Reed. He was an All-American from Maryland, goalie. And he said, who wants to play goalie? I said, yeah, I'll play. He said, all right. After the game, he said, dude, you have got to play goalie. <laughs> From now on, you have got to play goalie. And so I did, but I would come out, uh, you know, when uh, there was a penalty on the other other side and the short short stick would be brought out to me by the second string goalie and I'd play at the top of the midfield. I think they called it Nat O eventually. <laughs> and, I would, you know, I would occasionally put one past the, you know, the other guy. He loved that, of course. And then I'd run back to the goal. Um, but the thing about goalie that I came to appreciate is exactly as you say it is the last it's the last line of defense and it is a combination of being a little bit oh a little sideways you know not uh you know it's a little bit touched and a little bit zen and I love that combination the thing you feel that, that way when you act when uh, you when they go action, do you get into that same space? Yeah, there's absolutely a, a level of focus that's required that's identical to the focus that you 
you employ when you're playing sports. And that was one of the reasons that I, when I started acting in college, that I was a little bit conflicted because I was drawing from the same thing. And it was kind of like, you know, I, I couldn't quite uh, juggle it at the time. But yeah, there's absolutely the same focus is that you've got to pull yourself down. You've got to breathe. You've got to find that kind of Zen-like center. And that's, yeah, that's what I loved about, about, uh, about being in the goal is, is 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 just you know it's meditative in a way it's a little bit crazy but it's meditative and the thing that changed for me in goal was one day in practice when i was getting scored on i think it was paul fear he was scoring I was like, uh, uh, I mean, he scored on a lot of people i was like yeah and one day it just flashed on me that it hurt more to be scored on than it did to be hit by that ball mm-hmm. and when that hit me when that realization hit me, it was over. It was a new day because I just, man, I just, uh, it, it just took, uh, it would, ju- it just took everything. Like for me, not, you know, to be scored on was, it, it wasn't, di- it was being scored on and it was seeing other people celebrate at my expense that I just could not tolerate. <laughs> it's so funny you say that just because I remember so distinctly, you may remember Taddy Hall and uh, Taddy was playing goalie. And one day he was in the net before practice and I took a shot that he didn't see coming and it caught him in the inside of the left thigh, put a welt on the inside of his left thigh. And that was the end of Taddy's goalie career. And as you we know, he went on to play lacrosse at Yale. So it's a good thing I got him out of the net and up up to midfield. But yeah. anyway, um, too good. So um, I did the opposite sort of. Yeah, exactly. Which I love. And that's probably why you were such a good goalie. Um, so political science major at Amherst, yeah, not drama, not acting, and yeah. um, in in one of your first roles, Jeff, you were interacting with Harrison Ford, and he made a comment towards the director of referring to him as sir. Yeah, a moment ago, you talked about these people with these great ideas and teamwork and how everything comes together. Talk for a moment about the impression that Harrison Ford had on you when he called the director sir. Yeah, well, that was a film called Presumed Innocent. I think it was shot in 1989. It was very early in my career. It may have been the fr- it was the first major film that I uh, played a part in, and I play a very small part. I'm a bearded blur in the background as Harrison walks by uh, early in the film. He plays district attorney. I'm a young district attorney working in the office. Yeah, and again, I got the gig because I had a political science degree. I, you know, I just started acting, just moved to New York, had done a few, couple of plays here and there. And, but, you know, I was pretty lost on a movie set. And this was out in Kaufman Astoria Studios out in Queens. If I had, you know, a subway token to make it back to my apartment in Manhattan, I was lucky. And I go in there and I'm sitting next to Harrison Ford. You know, he's at the peak of his career at the time. And we rehearsed for about a week, you know, to kind of build the authentic- authenticity of the office. And there were some other folks who were lawyers as well, who had, uh, you know, who had been pulled together to make up this, uh, you know, the rest of that section of the cast. Alan Pakula, who had directed all the president's men and, you know, just a legendary uh, old school, wonderful, brilliant director, uh, was uh, was at the helm with this. and. Uh, we got uh, to the point of filming and we're on set one day and he calls out from across the room, across the set to Harrison, just says Harrison. And, 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 and the response was, sir. And I, I was, yeah, at, it set off a bell in my ear because it wasn't an environment that was, you know, Just kind of anything goes and, you know, what you might expect on a movie set. People have this impression of what we do. uh, And it's it's often not, you know, not on the mark as, as, you know, I think my expectations. I I didn't know what to expect. But what, what I what I learned that day was that he was teaching me a level of respect for the for the director and for your collaborators and for the process and he was showing me that, you know, there's a type of decorum that comes along with this thing that's not unlike what we learned in school, Willie. Right. Yeah. I, and, 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 and 
And I realized two things. One, what was expected, but I also realized that I knew how to do that. Right. Because I had been trained in that way. And, uh, and it stayed with me. It's, it, it's, it stayed with me throughout my career. What we do when it's, I say this all the time, what we do uh, when we work on stage or on film, particularly in film, because there's so many moving parts, what we do is um, at its best is, uh, is collaborate. What we do sometimes at its worst is collaborate. It depends on who you're working with and uh, and and how you treat one another. It also depends on the talent and and you know the capacity of everyone around. But it's a collaborative effort. I love this aspect of it more than anything. I've grown to love that we work as a kind of microcosm of society. And again, people don't really have an appreciation for this if you're not on a film set. But there are people you know, from, you know, various walks of life, various talents, all more or less artistically uh, uh, inclined, whether you be an electrician or a carpenter or, uh, you know, a grip who, you know, moving the lights and, you know, uh, and, 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 and the like, or working in the office, you want to be there because you like making film, you like telling stories, but you do it as part of a larger whole. And when I, you know, I'm in front of the camera and the camera's on me, my job is to fill the frame. But that's no more important, really, than every piece of effort that has gone in to creating that frame. And everything that everyone uh, is a part of is about simply that, is about telling the story frame by frame. And and I, I just love, I love that pressure as you described, because it is like being in the goal. Okay. It's, you know, we're 18 hours into the day now. Everybody's tired. You know, we've got a couple of more shots to get and, you know, we're rushing to get them all and you've got to center yourself, calm yourself, do it, do it well, do it efficiently, get on to the next one, do that well and efficiently and go home. Nobody wants to be there all day, wasting a lot of time. And there's an appreciation that's shown from the crew um, that I really value when, you know, when they see the actor who's got all the attention on him, you know, who's, who's you know, most often making more than everybody else, you know, uh, to do that work when he's respectful of everyone's efforts, everyone's time and of the process. And Harrison, yeah, Harrison, you know, he tipped my hat to that a little bit. Uh, I, or, I heard, I heard a number of, as I was doing some research for this, Jeff, I heard you in a number of instances on after filming big films, um, talk about a grip who was on the set, who became a really good friend of yours and mentioned them by name. And so your comment about the teamwork and everyone who goes into that production, um, not only did you be friends with them, but you gave them props afterwards and doing a lot of the PR around the, around the film. So uh, well, and I'm sure that that reflects, I'm sure that reflects really well upon you when you show up on a on a set. In other words, I mean, there clearly got to be actors who have bad raps and actors who have great raps and someone who sits there and says, yeah, I've worked with Jeffrey before and he's amazing. And he was really nice. And he understood the importance of everyone around him. I mean, that's got to make them more collaborative with you and helping you and saying, Hey, we saw something here or what have you. I mean, it's, it's quite something. Well, I met Harrison's, uh, a agent hadn't met him before. This was in Cannes last year. I was over there with Asteroid City, Wes Anderson's movie. And I told him that story. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's pro shit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's it. Right there. That, you know, so, that's, so, what you, that's what you want to be. Hang on a second. So, all right. We just talked about Harrison Ford. I want to jump for forward to Bastiat because that was your real breakthrough role. Um, yeah. And 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 as we've just talked about, you'd met Harrison Ford in 89. I know you met Sidney Poitier somewhere in there. And I want to loop back to Sidney and what he told you in a moment. Yeah. But you're on you're filming Bastiat, and Bastiat had this in, incredible cast. I mean, Willem Dafoe is there, and there are all these amazing um uh uh other actors. But then all of a sudden, David Bowie shows up. Now, yeah. I gotta tell you, Jeffrey, I know you've met a lot of people. But when I thought about you sitting there having David Bowie show up 
to be an actor on that movie and play Andy Warhol. Yeah. I was just like, talk about a really cool experience. Talk, talk to me for a second about David Bowie. Cause I just, I mean, they're actors and then there's David Bowie, the musician who ends up being an actor in that movie. I mean, how cool. Yeah. I mean, he, he meant so much to me through his music. <clears throat> uh, there were periods of my life, you know, when, he, you know, uh, Hunky Dory it was like that album was a was 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 a serving as a score. Uh, he, I mean, just supreme, supremely talented, and he, yeah, was cast to play Warhol. Uh, you know, Dennis Hopper was in this film. Uh, Gary Oldman, who was a big influence on me, Hopper was a big influence. Chris Walken, massive influence on me, and Willem, as you say. But David was a, you know, David, you know, kind of holds a space by himself. And the first day that I met him, I was painting in Julian Schnabel's studio. And Julian uh, was the director. Julian was the director. And he gave me, you know, leave to basically come whenever I wanted, you know, night or day and, and, and paint uh, to understand the process of painting and try to, you know, be comfortable with it. Uh, when the time came to shoot the film, some days I'd be in there and there'd be, you know, a dozen, a dozen and a half actual Basquiat paintings lined up around me. And I would take images from one images from another and put them on a canvas and try to create my own kind of Frankensteinian Basquiat, you know, just to really understand, again, the process, but also to understand his imagery, his language, his, you know, his poetry, all of that stuff. And so the, the producers were also collectors of art. And so they were going around buying up uh, his work in anticipation. How, of how come you didn't get into your contract that part of your pay was for a Bastiat? Just, just one. Just I, like I, 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 my contract was a schnabel. I got a schnabel and I was too nice. hungry and young at the time to actually fight for it. Another thing, I didn't have an agent at the time. That's a long story. That's another story. This is after I won the Tony. I couldn't get an agent. So I had a lawyer, lawyer, old school uh, entertainment lawyer. It was Chris Walken's lawyer as well who negotiated that contract. He did very well, but I got a, a schnabel out of it. Don't remind me, Willie. Don't remind me. <laughs> I just uh, yeah, I just so, so people know when I when I saw that and was thinking about if you'd gotten paid in a Bastiat. The, the most expensive Bastiat ever sold is now $105 million. And the, the the top 10 are between 30 and 105 million. So if you'd just gotten one of those top 10 Bastiats, it would have been a would have been a really good day. But anyway, I'm just really Willie, I'm, aw I'm aware of those figures. <laughs> yeah. I'm aware. Uh yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but I guess the other piece to it is that in that role. But you're asking about Bowie. Hold on. You're asking about yeah, Bowie. I know. Yeah. Hold on. I'll tell you when I first we sing a song for you. We sang together, actually. Uh... Yeah. But I hit a I hit a bad note and he was like, yeah, I'll tell you. Well, the, he I met him. I was painting in the studio. He, the door opens and in he walks. I'm on my knees on this canvas, you know, kind of, you know, working down on the floor. And he comes down and he kneels down next to me. And he says, he says, right. Do you, do you mind if I watch? And uh, do a terrible David there. He said, do you mind if I watch? And I said, uh, well, I, I think I'm going to have to get used to it. And uh, <laughs> we had a laugh. And uh, and we were off from there. Uh, yeah. And I, I, at one point, I did. So, I, I don't know. He played some music for me. I've told this story from his from this album called Outside. We were in the hair and makeup trailer. Gary uh, Oldman and I, and in walks David. And he's like, Hey, you know, you, you want to hear some music and, you know, my, my album. I'm like, what? You didn't like this unreleased album. We're like, yeah, yeah, of course we'd like, you know, to to we'll tolerate your indulgence there, Mr. Bowie. You know, like we're freaking out. He puts on this music and it's just brilliant. And uh, he's a guitarist. I just remember this distinctly. This guitarist named Reeves Gabrels, who is like, plays this beautiful abstracted, like, like crazy lead guitar, beautiful stuff. Like so, like just so. Uh, it's just got a abstract lyricism to it, just badass. And David's like air guitaring to it as we're listening to it. And we're like, what? You know, it's like David Bowie sitting there air guitaring to it. But one day, I did. I used to love that Bing Crosby duet that he did. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah, sure. 
he does this thing with his face at one point. He, you know, Bean Crosby's going, going uh, 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 he's doing the, you know, the kind of bass line, and, 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 and David goes, peace on earth, can it be? was for my child and your child but he he goes he goes he does this thing where he goes peace on earth and he kind of considers it there's this moment where he considers it and it's just this beautiful just a small detail in his performance that i always noticed i was just kind of enthralled i think i butchered the lyrics there but i actually asked him to sing that (laughs) to sing that with me one day and he did we, you know, we had a laugh together, but I think I hit, I hit an off note and he kind of stopped. I remember when there was once he had incredibly attuned ears. I remember we were watching some video that Julian was showing us that related to something inside the film. And like the playback was off and there was like this kind of odd sound that, you know, that came out of the speaker. And David, like, it was like, he was like hearing something that he couldn't like, he couldn't bear, and he like kind of react. His, his, he was, you know, he was, uh, he was a, you know, he was a supreme musician. Uh, and he, yeah, yeah. So when I, yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to do too many more duets with me after. Uh, <laughs> so first. you you mentioned all the great actors in that movie, but one, as I've listened to a lot of your interviews, that comes back as somebody that you really, really look up to and think is at the top, top of his game is Gary Oldham. What yeah. is it about Gary that is so unique as an actor that puts him in your sort of, I think you were act by somebody to do your top five and he fits in your top five and what have, what was it about him that is so unique as a, as an actor? Well, personally, what's unique is that there are his performance in Sid and Nancy really opened my eyes to what was possible and influenced my performance in Basquiat in not insignificant ways and also in Shaft and also in Ride with the Devil in these ways, because those were the films that I uh, that I did right at that time. Uh, and it was shortly uh, after I'd seen the film, not too, too long after I'd seen the film. It was really in this way. He showed kind of uh, a range of emotional generosity that I don't think I'd seen before. He had there this kind of extreme range that he was willing to go to that I had never seen before. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I thought, you know, like, you know, the, the, the poles were here. And he said, no, no, they're well beyond that. And it just gave me uh, a license to just, you know, turn it up a few notches also the ways in which he played character uh i appreciate it dustin hoffman was was one early on that really struck me just in in the way he crafted personas you know from one film to another i just loved that way of 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 working and i i thought that's the way that it was to be done uh it just seemed like you know that was the magic of this stuff is being able to transform and 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 uh and i think it also has a kind of philosophical quality to it in that it seems to me an expression of empathy you know this ability to recognize oneself inside a person very much unlike you uh, to recognize you know, that there's more difference between or there's there's more similarities uh, between us all than difference. I think that, you know, it approaches kind of pretentious when you talk about it, uh, this work in that way. But I do think there's an element of that. And it and 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 there are certain actors who step outside of themselves and they subsume their own egos and find, you know, and 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 find something in someone new. And I think that's interesting. Gary actually in an interview recently said that for him playing with, you know, character and the mask was a way of hiding, you know, hiding in that he felt uh, uh, more recently playing roles that are more similar to him. He felt naked and terrified by the idea. There may be something to that. I like the idea of playing with mask. I think it does allow a certain freedom, but I, 
I, I don't know if I'm necessarily terrified by playing a character closer to myself. I just haven't found that many. That said, American well, fiction. American fiction. Yeah. American fiction, which we'll dive into that in a second. But before we yeah. go to American fiction, um, the advice that Sidney Poitier gave you, which is very interesting in the context of what you just said about Gary and how Gary had this great breadth of emotion and being able to take these roles. Poitier's advice to you is you don't need to play the note. Expand a little bit on what he meant by you don't need to play the note. Well, that's my interpretation of it. What he said was one word at the end of this film, and it was the first kind of significant role that I'd had in a major production. It was opposite him. He was playing Thurgood Marshall. The miniseries was separate but equal. I was playing, based on the Brown versus Board of Education case, I was playing the youngest of the attorneys that worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, a guy named uh, uh, Bill Coleman, who who uh, went on to be, I think, transportation secretary under Ford. Anyway, my first significant role, opposite Sidney Poitier, I have no clue like what I'm in for. And I, you know, again, you know, I think I was hired because I had a little, you know, background in this stuff. And, uh, and I went for it. Cleavon Little was in, was in that as well. And uh, a guy named Albert Hall, who played chef in a pot, a chief rather in Apocalypse Now, who was like, God, so meaningful to me. But Sydney, of course, Sydney is, you know, he's at the top of the masthead. He's, uh, he was just such a gracious man and so generous and so, you know, extremely talented and, and naturally just elegant, beautiful guy, beautiful guy. And at the end of the production, I said to him, you know, as I would, you know, dopey, you know, 24 year old, oh, Mr. Poitier, uh, you have any advice for me? And he said, Irony. Irony. That's all he said. And and I knew exactly what he meant because I was I was playing everything just as, you know, straight as an arrow, you know, just, you know, no, no spin on that ball at all. And he was saying, come at it. You know, don't don't. Yeah. Don't just play that straight note. You know, you have. You know, you have opportunity to work with it. And really what we're doing is interpreting the word on the page. We're not, you know, we're not reading the word on the page. We're not, you know, we're, 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 it's our job to interpret it and to fill it with tone and life that makes it compelling and makes it more lifelike. So, yeah, that was, uh, that was his advice. Irony. Yeah, young man. <laughs> um, American fiction opens up with you in a college classroom, one would assume. Doesn't actually put it on a college campus, but I'm yeah. assuming it's a college professor. Um, and the N-word is on the whiteboard, and there's a white student in there who says that she's offended by it. And you say, well, uh, I've gotten over it. Maybe you should. And she gets up and storms out of the room. Yeah. Um, later on, there's a scene where you're spreading the ashes of your of your uh, late sister in the ocean and the neighbor presumably on Cape Cod walks along and says, do you have a permit to spread those ashes? And you, your brother and you simultaneously tell him to go get lost. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you're also invited in the movie to be a judge on a, for an exclusive literary award. And the, the guy who invites you to come on all but says, the only reason we're asking you is because you're black. Yeah. Um, so there, there's an, a lot in there, Jeff, that you and the director Cord Jefferson, kind of take a take a hatchet at that at wokeness are 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 you anti-woke well i'm glad you asked that um i i don't even understand what that word means here's why that word has been co-opted now by the right in america to essentially mean anything that they oppose the word woke comes from a Huddy Ledbetter song, early 20th century, in which he is speaking to his audience, Black community of the South, telling them to keep woke to the dangers of, of the American South at that time. 
rise of the Klan, post-Reconstruction, backlash to the extension of rights to Black Americans in this country, violence. That's the origin of it. However, that word has evolved. It's evolved in the Black community to the point in the last decade or so, if you were woke, if you're woke, if the young, you know, brothers say you're woke, you're certainly mistrustful of government, probably seriously suspicious of a vaccine, uh, mistrustful of a wide range of American institutions. If you're woke, you're actually a lot like these right wingers now. I was just, as you just said that, I was saying, do, are you talking about Trumpers? Or are you talking about black and Americans? Co opted that term and used it as a weapon against people who are, you know, just working and maybe not always working well, but working toward the expansion of rights to everyone in this country. So I'm just going to take a little bit of exception with that term from the start, because I really have no idea what it means. One thing that Cord and I talked about, a couple of things that we talked about in our film, is that we didn't want my character to be perceived as a kind of, you know, celebrant of the perspective of the Black bourgeois, a classicist, you know, a classist, rather, in his take. We didn't want the film to be that. Uh, we, 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 we wanted him to be flawed, we wanted him to be uh, perhaps an unreliable, unreliable narrator at times, you know, and we wanted him to, to, to transform over, you know, to, to self-reflect and, and, and change. He's not the same man at the beginning that he is at the end of the movie. He goes through a process of, of like kind of, uh, you know, of, of, of self-discovery. We also wanted to be very cautious that this guy is not representing uh kind of a a conservative position on race inclusion uh identity but that he's representing a perspective that comes from within that comes from within the black community and that as well exists on the left there is a self-criticism that we wanted to bake into this story that I think is healthy and seriously important. On the right, the idea, the conversation uh, is being had around these issues of race and identity and inclusion, but it's a conversation that's being had so that those things can go away. It's being a converse, it's, it's a conversation that's happening at the same time that the history behind these efforts to broaden rights in our country is being rejected as, uh, as un-American, right? There's an attempt simultaneously to um, ignore all of the historical pressures that have led to this unlevel playing field, all of the historical pressures that have been in place really to create a permanent underclass among Black Americans in this country. So it's a, there's a disingenuous, I think, uh, uh, interest in these issues now, or a destructive interest in these issues from certain segment of our society. What we wanted to reflect was an interest in these issues, not so that they disappear, but so that they be handled better handled more effectively, handled more justly, because they should be. Not because we, uh, you know, we want to throw darts only at the white liberal. Yeah. We want to throw darts at everyone, including ourselves. And what I find interesting about our film is there are some conservative voices here, if you listen closely in the film, but, you know, they're largely not present <laughs> in the story <laughs> because you know we 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 kind of know you know what the take is i love that you know i love that they find a place inside this though because there's been a lot of 
interest I've seen uh, from various writers and, you know, kind of trying to co-opt it. But we want everyone to join us in this conversation, to join us in this film, to find a place within this film, both in, term, in terms of the personal side and also in the side, in the side that deals with, you know, with these with these, you know, these thorny social issues, because we want we, we want to come together and, and, and talk about these things in a way that's digestible for everyone and in a way that leads to progress. At the end of the day, you know, what else is what else is there to do? Uh, I thought one of the great lines, Jeff, was when your agent and your your it's it's when you're I guess the name has already been changed. If I've got to remember from when I watched the film, but you're, the name of the book's already been changed, which is just absurd. That whole yeah. Scene. yeah. But and then he turns to you and he goes, "White people don't want to know the truth; they just want to be absolved." And right. then you turn to him and you go, fortunately, that's not my problem. Right. Right. <laughs> Which I thought was such right. a great line. Right. And that ain't my issue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the other, one of the but, other but, ones. But I think that that's a poignant line. And I think, you know, from the right and the left, yeah, to some extent, we just want to, you know, sweep it under the rug and move on. You know, some, there's a portion of the society, maybe white folks want to do that. But yeah, that's, uh, that's not going to get the job done. That's not going to solve, that's not going to, you know, that's not going to keep the, uh, you know the history from biting come from from circling back and biting us in the ass, which we're seeing it do, and you know, and it's not going to keep, uh, you know, it's not going to keep this, uh, you know, this 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 group of people in our society from suffering from these historical ills and acting out in ways that are you know counterproductive to their interests and counterproductive to larger uh, interests of uh, of our society. So yeah. No, but that's but that's a yeah, that's a that's a good line. A lot of good lines in there. Yeah, there are a bunch of good lines. What, what, you know, the best line in the movie, though, I forgot to put in. Which is what? It was in that scene in the in, you know, that first scene in the classroom. Uh actually it refers to that first scene in the classroom. The scene that follows is this kind of interrogation right. you know, with the colleagues, in which essentially he's, you know, he's asked to leave. He's canceled, you know, he's to go, you know, go on leave for a while to take a break. And we shot that scene, that second scene, after a few cuts of the movie had been done. That was an additional day. There were a few days that we had, you know, that few uh, one day that we had to work on a few scenes. And Cord and I were going over the scene and we're talking about a response because they're saying, you know, you made our, you made that student, you made your students uncomfortable with this reading of uh, Flannery O'Connor's book, a uh, short story actually, uh, the artificial. That's the name of the book. It's a book on Southern literature. She's a, you know, Southern Gothic American writer. That's the name of the book. Words on the on the whiteboard behind me. So the guy, you know, one of the colleagues says, you made your students comfortable, uncomfortable. And uh, and the line that Cord, and I said, Cord, you know, we had in this guy said, you should say something like, well, don't take it up with me. And Cord said, yeah. T I said, take it up with me. Take it up with, I don't take it up with Flannery O'Connor. And Cord said, yeah, I'll get you a Ouija board. <laughs> and so that was the line. And when, and, 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 and the, you know, when you work on the, there's a lot going on. I actually had a back issue going on that day. I had to get a chiropractor to come on uh, set to help me walk. Uh, I, I'd injured something biking anyway. Got to that moment and I forgot to put that line in, but I I I think it's I think it's the well it's certainly the best line not in the movie. Take it up with Flannery O'Connor, I'll get you a Ouija board. <laughs> so there, there's another line that I heard you say in an interview about family. And the real one of the main reasons why you came to the film, as you said previously, was how it the, the relationship between the son and the mother and uh, and if you will, all the dysfunction in the family. And I heard you say that so a friend of yours said that family puts the fun in dysfunction. And I, I don't know, that was such a great saying because all of us have dysfunction in our families. Yeah. And so think about family being fun as far as dysfunction is good. And, but then in the movie- Well, I've got to credit uh, someone you know for that one. Who's that? One John McDonald. Oh, really? Yeah, he came to see a screening. Yeah. We actually went to L, uh, to SoFi to see the uh, the formerly known as the Skins play uh, the Rams. And during his visit, he saw a screening of the film, and he said, "Yes, yeah, uh, I think it was somebody in his family. As somebody, in, uh, as my cousin says, they put the fun in dysfunction." So I got a I got a footnote, John. There, that's McD awesome. 
Yeah. That's that's great. And then but then also in the movie, there's that line which I think is 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 really great, where your brother in the movie, Cliff, says um to Lorraine, I don't want to impose, to which Lorraine says, You can impose your family. Yeah. And I, I, I gotta say, I think every once in a while w- people who are members of family forget that that you forget that someone who is part of your family can't impose. In other words, you know, you got to deal with this stuff. I thought, I I thought all of that was so telling about families and dysfunction. And then also quite honestly, you got to deal with the stuff. And particularly at the end of a life, you sit there and say, well, this isn't for me to take care of. And it's like, well, yeah, it is. It's, you you got it. It's inescapable. Yeah. Um, One other one that Cliff says, which I thought was great, where they're talking about you having a blind spot to your dad in the the movie, having cheated on your mom and your brother Cliff says, enemies see each other better than friends. Yeah. I got to say, the moment I heard that, Jeff, I was like, I went through my Rolodex of those people who I'm not all that fond of. And all of a sudden I said to myself, I know a lot more about them than I know about my great friends. It's such a great line. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cords, um, you know, Cords, is, he's got a sharp pen. Um, and, you know, he just won the BAFTA this weekend for adapted screenplay, which was well-deserved. Uh, yeah, super, super sharp writer. And he 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 dove into this project, uh, you know, a little bit on a personal agenda, I think, as did mm-hmm. I when I read it. Uh, Percival Everett, who wrote the novel Erasure, which is based on, in D.C., uh, recently did a, a conversation with cord and percival said that i i don't write autobiographical uh novels but there's a lot of me in this man uh cord saw a lot of overlaps with himself uh when he read the book likewise i did when i read the the script and so i think we the three of us are kind of variations on a theme but cord really dove into this with a good deal of passion and he says the, that reading that book was the most, it, it, it was, you know, the most moving experience he'd had with a, with a piece of art, uh, uh, you know, uh, in his, in his life and, uh, and, and, and since. And so, yeah, he, he, uh, he was on his A game with this one. Big time. And just one aside that most people probably don't know, but Cord comes from a mixed race family and his yeah. maternal grandfather um, was so disappointed at his daughter marrying a black man that he basically discommunicated himself from Cord and his mom, which I mean, yeah. again, it's just, I mean, heavy stuff. Really yeah. Heavy stuff. yeah, that, that, that's right. That's right. And his dad, uh, his mom was white and liberal, his dad, black, uh, Republican. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you've done your homework, Willie. I'm very impressed. I've done a little bit of homework. So um, just a couple of quick things to close this out, because I know you got a lot of things to go do. First of all, Nancy Nippleton and Mouse, are they yeah. still around? And and when, how often do you have to feed them? Oh, they're absolutely around. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, my turtles that my uh, daughter named, uh, I should say they're our turtles, um, but she came home from canal street with her mom one day with a brown paper bag and these you know like half dollar sized turtles which are now massive things uh (laughs) you know pancake size uh the reason that they are not larger is because i feed them sparingly don't feed them every day feed them I tend to feed them twice a week like i'll feed them saturday and sunday and then i'll give them a kind of snack on on Wednesday of uh, of a calcium uh, calcium chew, uh, and you know, and then occasionally I'll go out and get them a you know the, their favorite treat, which is which is about thirty uh, uh, rosy red minnows, which is great. Tires them out, you know. They sometimes a few of those minnows are are clever and you know manage to survive. I think one survived for over a week uh once but uh but most often they they disappear in a in a few minutes but uh yeah don't feed them too too often because they'll you know they'll 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 outgrow the tank quickly i got them in an 80 gallon tank which probably i need to expand i'm gonna have to break out a wall uh, to do that uh but yeah they're characters um and they are uh, they're they're thriving they're doing very well hardy 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 creatures yeah, I know you skate- if well if well if well 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 maintained. Yeah, I know you skateboarded as a kid, I broke did. your leg in a pool when you were fourteen. Which I I'm just trying to foot it out. 
Did you miss a season with that 75 pound Metro boys club team? That was the best team you ever played on other than maybe the Amherst lacrosse team your senior year? Jesus, Willie, you, you know, what are you, Jesus, you, you just, you, 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 you know too much. Uh, that was no, it helps when you grew up with somebody, my friend, it's, yeah. it's to go to Wikipedia. It's another thing that, you know, the person's life, but uh, my question to you is, that, that was, no, that was, that was after my, uh, eighth grade. That was, that happened eighth grade. Oh, you were well over 75 pounds then. So that, that, yeah, was, was, it was, it was back in sixth grade. So what I did, I ended up, I didn't play football, freshman football that year because I was, you know, my, my, my leg was toothpick size because the cast was on all summer. So I ran cross country with Skip Grant. But yeah, that happened out at a place called Skate World, I believe. Oh, I remember Skate in, World. Oh, yeah. yeah. In that oh, pool yeah. out there. Last run of the day. And but, like, but you're perfect. now a surfer. You're now a surfer. Where do you like to surf? I surf uh, when I'm out here. I live right by the water. So I basically just, you know, make it out to, uh, you know, back behind where I stay here. I go out to uh, a place called County Line here uh, in L.A. And also, uh, you know, I'll go down to First Point, uh, which is probably the most famous break out here. A really beautiful wave, a peeling uh, point break. It's a you know, it's super crowded out there, but it's super fun too. A lot of characters. That's probably where I surfed the most and where I learned the most. I started out in Hawaii, went out yeah. there vacation with my kids, and then went back uh, to film the Hunger Games later that same year in 2012. And I just you know, I bought a, bought, I took a couple more lessons, bought a board of my own, and just started going out. And I more or less haven't stopped since. Yeah, that's Very awesome. Expensive. The get the water softer than the concrete, Willie. You know, That's for sure. Yeah. So final, final, fun. final question. Um, win or lose at the Oscars, and again, congratulations on that nomination. It's just Thank huge. You. Um, Thank you. but you're now playing sort of on a different play field. Uh, you're in rarefied air being a, a an Oscar nominated for best actor role. Um, gives you a little bit more agency, if you will, as it relates to what you're doing, the types of projects. Um Anything really that you're sitting there saying, maybe I want to write some more, maybe I want to direct, or do you want to just keep cranking along at what you're doing so well? Yeah, I've got a couple of projects that I'm thinking about from a director's point of view. I'd like to uh, er, 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 working on a couple of scripts, one particularly that's uh, that I think could be very interesting. I'd like to direct. I'd like to work with actors. I like, I think I have a pretty good eye. You know, I was photography editor of the St. Albans News uh, senior year, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've always, I've always uh, <laughs> looked through a lens. And I'd like to apply the perspective uh, that I've gained over many years of being on sets and telling story in that way. I think it would be, uh, it would be, uh, I think I would, I would enjoy it. And yeah, you know, it's nice to do this stuff and not be in front of the camera as well. Uh, that'd be a nice, a nice uh, break. So looking at a couple things, but as far as the, you know, the nomination goes, I've been doing this long enough as well to understand that uh, I don't take anything for granted. Mm -hmm. As I was saying, I won a Tony in Angels in America, one of the, you know, not, you know, the greatest play of the last several decades and uh, i talked to four different major agencies after having won the tony i couldn't get an agent after four i stopped talking to them because if they couldn't figure it out i wasn't going to explain it to them anymore and i went on my own and ultimately I, I i linked up with my agent uh and uh i've been with the same agent now for 20 I don't know, 26 years. I don't know how long it's been. But uh, so my point is, I know this business. I know how it works to an extent. Uh, and I know that, uh, I don't, you know, don't assume anything. Yeah. So this is, this is wonderful recognition. It's coming from my peers. I'm super appreciative of that. Uh, it's coming as well because we've got a, a massive level of support from the studio backing this film from Orion and Amazon MGM that have put the effort and resources and time and energy into our film to make sure that it was seen, uh, to make sure that it found an audience, but also that it was seen by those who, uh, 
you know, who consider these things, uh, you know, the academy voters and the like. So that's been the difference here uh, in terms of this project. All of the agree- ingredients came together in a way that, uh, you know, that uh, that cooked a dish that, you know, we can say now uh, is Oscar nominated. But I don't take I don't take any of it for granted. And, uh, you know, you're only as good as your next one, Willie. That's that's for sure, Jeff. I'll just say this. First of all, I'll be sitting there watching and 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 fingers crossed. Second of all, if you win it, my my friend Jamie Lee Curtis won last year, and I've got oh, a wow. picture actually next to my desk at home that I took with my iPhone of Jamie on ABC, and so it's got the ABC of her giving her acceptance speech last year. And so oh, wow. uh, here's to taking a picture of you on national television receiving it, and I'll put the two of them right next to each other as the two people I know who won Oscars. So anyway. Well, that'd be that'd, that'd be that'd be cool, man. That'd be um, cool. Thank you for your time. I'm super appreciative. What a joy. Um, I'll tell Hereford you say hi when I see him tonight and when I see Bennett later on this week. Um, we, a real trip down memory lane today for me, Jeff. Thank you so much. Man, Willie, it's been a long time we've known each other. It's so good to see you today, man, and see how far you've come as well. Uh, from that little guy running around, <laughs> running around with a, with a lacrosse stick uh, in his hands, man, it's been uh, it's been it's seems lifetimes uh, from now. But it's wonderful to see you, bro. Same to Thank you, my friend. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care, man. Bye.